All right, are we ready to hear the word today? Yes. All right. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you now in the name of Jesus for everyone here. God, I pray that you would just open our hearts to your spirit, to your word, that we might hear together what you have to say to us today. We ask you to bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're continuing the ser series on the Holy Family, Advent 2023. Today we're going to be talking about Joseph and his relationship to Mary and what it was about Joseph's life that enabled him to respond to the calling of God in his life. And that is trust and obedience. And so we'll be talking about Joseph today. I believe the story of Joseph is really quite a fascinating story. And that it illustrates to us how trust and obedience work together to bring about God's sovereignty in relationship to the birth of the Messiah. And so we're going to, in, in, tangled in all of that today, we're going to talk about how God's sovereignty works. I know it's a big subject, but how it works in relationship to our free will. How many know we all have a free will, but yet at the same time, we want God's sovereignty working in our lives. And when we, when we talk about God's sovereignty, what we're talking about is that God's going to get his way no matter what. He will. And, but he's, he's stuck with us. He was stuck with Joseph and Mary and all of the other characters that are involved in the Christmas story. And so the coming of the Messiah was a great event that all Israel was looking forward to. That was their hope as Aaron talked about last week. It was their hope for the future. It was their hope for the now. They were waiting in anticipation for the Messiah to come. And so I'm gonna start out reading today about the prophetic message that they had instilled their hope in. And one of those passages is found in Isaiah 9 and verses 6 through 7. Some of these passages are very familiar to us, but I think it's still helpful to read them and to see them. I always put them on slides because I think it's important to see as well as hear. It helps us to retain things. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Notice these names that he's called. The Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Counselor. Right there you have all three of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The fullness of the Godhead will rest upon Jesus. And then because of that, he's given the name that represents the fullness of the Godhead. And that name is the Lord that represents the Father. Jesus that represents the Son. And Christ that represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit within us. And that's why, actually, you know, when you look at baptism, it seems confusing sometimes because Jesus says, I want you to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we find the disciples always baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or in Jesus, or in Jesus Christ. That's how they baptized, because they understood that that name represented the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then it goes on to say, of the increase of his government... Of the, or that could say of the increase of his kingdom. And so his kingdom is still increasing right before our eyes. Of the increase of his kingdom or the government and peace, there will be no end. Aren't you thankful for that? Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom 
to order it and establish it with justice and judgment. From that time forward, even forever. And so what he's establishing, what he established in the New Testament and what he continues to establish in our lives to establish in our lives is ongoing forever and ever and ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. That's an amazing statement. It was the zeal of the Lord that brought forth his Messiah. And it's the zeal of the Lord that brings forth in our lives. And then we go to Isaiah 7 and verse 14, where it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which Aaron already said means God with us. How many know that God is with us today? Amen. Amen. His Holy Spirit is here with us. His Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father is and as God the Son is. They are one and they are all here today and we are fellowshipping with them. The Bible really doesn't have a whole lot to say about Joseph. <laughs> Which made, made it kind of a subject, okay, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> but I believe God found a way to make this really interesting for us. And so the Bible doesn't really have much to say about Joseph, but one thing is sure, and that Joseph was the one whom God knew. God knew Joseph. He knew how to trust and obey in all things. That's Joseph. And so let's talk about Joseph's background a little bit before we get started here. We know that he was engaged to be married to Mary and became her husband. And at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Joseph, his adopted father, had probably already passed away. Joseph passed away, if you go back and read all the tradition and everything, it, at a very early life. Beginning of his ministry, he had already passed away because for the most part, the average life expectancy wasn't that great back in those days. And with his occupation, accidents were high. And so there's a lot of reasons, you know, we could you know, conjure up that might be why get too far in life. But those who knew Jesus also knew Joseph. It says in John 6, 42, this is when Jesus is at Nazareth. And, he said to, and, he, and they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? And so how is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? And so the death of Joseph is strengthened by the fact that Luke records an event from the life of Joseph when Jesus was 12 years old, but then never mentions him again as living. Mark records events from Jesus' life only after his baptism, and as an adult, never mentions Joseph. Based on the best textual evidence Jesus' younger brothers were named Jacob, Joseph, or Joseph, Simon, and Judah, indicating that Joseph and Mary named one of their sons after Joseph. And so Joseph was also a carpenter. The New Testament preserves two references to Joseph's occupation, both calling him a tecton, which is interpreted in various ways since the New Testament times, including the generally in Accepted terms, carpenter or builder. And so we know that he was a carpenter. He was a builder. He may have built household furniture or homes, working specifically with lintels and joists, the main wood components of the first century house. Later traditions describe him, describe his employment as making plows or yokes. So let's talk about the person of Joseph for a while. 
There may be little that we know of Joseph, but in God's eyes, he knew Joseph well. So much so that it is Joseph whom he commissioned to be the earthly father who would raise the only begotten son of our heavenly father. That's an awesome responsibility when you think about it. I'm calling you, Joseph, to raise my only begotten son. I am entrusting you with his care. I am entrusting you with his safety. All of these things. I'm entrusting that you are going to raise him up to be a godly man. That's Joseph's calling. In the few short years of his life, that's what he is given to do, is to raise the Lord Jesus Christ from an infant through childhood and then into maybe his early teens. And I believe that one of God's characteristics is that he is omniscient. How many know what that means? It means that he is all knowing. God knows everything. In fact, he knows everything about you. He knows how you woke up this morning. He knows what you had for breakfast. He knows everything there is about you. He even knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows all of that. He knows our beginning. He knows us before our beginning. He knows our present. He knows our past, and he knows our future. We can take great comfort in the fact that God is all-knowing, that he knows our future. How many of you know your future? Most of us don't. We may have an inkling of what that future may entail, but we don't know the steps that we take every day, where they're going to lead us. But God already knows all that stuff. And that's why we need to follow him. We need to follow the Holy Spirit because he's already seen everything that we're going to do. And so through the Father's foreknowledge, he knew everything past, present, and future concerning Joseph's life. Just as he does about each and every one of us. And God relates to us accordingly to everything he sees, past, present, and future. That doesn't seem fair, does it? But it's more than fair. Because he can see our future. He can guide us around things that will stumble us. If we listen to him. If we, if we obey him. He can do that. The problem is sometimes he's working with our free will. And our free will doesn't want to obey so we get thrown off course. And God has to, <laughs> to work with us to get us back on course. And sometimes it can be quite painful getting back on course. And we wonder, why is this happening to me? It's because you weren't trusting. You weren't obeying. And so the more we trust, the more we obey the more good things happen to us because God is on our side. He's watching out for us. He knows our future and he knows Joseph's future. And so therefore, it's especially important for us to trust him in all things as we learn to walk in obedience to what he reveals to us. Paul the apostle, no, Peter, in his first epistle says this, terms of dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect. This is, this is a major scripture when it comes to the whole thing about predestination versus foreknowledge. Predestination always follows foreknowledge. Everything all the prophecies in the Bible, every, all of those are still being fulfilled. So then they, once, once, it's, once it's in God's heart, once it's in his mind, once he says it, it's in stone. And it becomes predestinated plans at that time. 
And so to get an idea of how our Heavenly Father knew Joseph and elected him to be the earthly father of Jesus, let's look at Psalms 139. Even though Psalms 139 is David speaking according to his circumstances, it is relevant to us as well. It speaks for all of us. As it says, our days were written and entered into his book before we were born. In Psalms 139, verses 1, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. God, you know me inside out. You know everything there is to know about me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. He knew when you sat down after worship today. <laughs> he knew when you rose up before worship. He knew when you got out of bed this morning. He knows all that stuff. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. <laughs> that could be a scary thought in itself, couldn't it? <laughs> you gotta be, that's why he says, bring every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Jesus Christ. Because he knows our thoughts. And when we bring every thought into the obedience and the captivity of Jesus Christ, you know what happens? His thoughts become our thoughts. His ways become our ways. And it gets ingrained into our spirit. It gets so ingrained into our spirit that we don't even have to think about it sometimes. His thoughts are reigning. Amen? His thoughts are guiding. His thoughts are doing all of that because we have immersed ourselves in his word, in his spirit, so that his life can reign through us. Amen? And that's what's happening in the life of Joseph. I believe Joseph has been a man of God all along because that's the way the Father ordained it for him. You know my sitting. You comprehend my path. I love that. You comprehend my path. You know what the word comprehend means? He says, I think about it. And I not only think about it, I think about what's best. I think about you in relationship to your path in life. I comprehend your path and my lying down and you are acquainted with all my ways. Guess what? You can't out trick God. Sometimes we think we can, don't we? But he sees everything. He knows everything. He knows when we're lying to ourselves. We may not lie to others sometimes, but a lot of times we lie to ourselves, don't we? We deceive ourselves. And that's not good. And I love verses 13 through 16. For you know, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Can you imagine, this is a little side thing here, can you imagine an artist creating this beautiful picture? This beautiful picture. And just about time for it to be completed, somebody comes in and destroys that picture. That's what we're doing with abortion. We're destroying the creation that God put together so perfectly. And then we have the audacity to destroy what he has made with his own hands. And we wonder why the world's in the state that it's in today. You formed me in my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. 
Before you, be, before you were even in, in your mother's womb, God saw you and knew you. He saw Joseph and knew Joseph. And he started writing the book about Joseph's life. As it says here, in your book, they were all written. When as yet, there were none of them. That is a very, very important statement. And that applies to each and every one of us here today. God has written your life in his book. And he doesn't want us to mess it up. <laughs> because then he has to go back and rework things to make it come out right. <laughs> and so the best thing that we can do in life, and you got to hear me on this, is the word trust. Yeah. Amen? The best word that we can learn in this life is how to trust in the Lord. To trust that his ways are perfect. That his ways are wonderful. And beautiful. And kind. And so you might ask, if Joseph's days were written in the book, how was he to know how to follow the book? How was he to know how to follow the script? It's like writing a movie script. <laughs> then, you, then you have to follow the script. And so how do we follow the script in our lives? How did Joseph follow the script in his life? Psalms 37 and verse 23 says, the steps of a good man or a good woman are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his ways. And so our steps, because God wrote the book, amen? Because it's already been written, he now wants to order our steps. I don't know about some of you, but I, I was in the military. I was in the army. And when you received orders, you didn't question those orders. You know why? Because the army owned you. That's what they would tell us. We own you. And so when I say jump, your response should be, how high, Sergeant? And that's the, the, the problem in our lives is that we haven't understood or learned the concept of first obedience. We waste a lot of time. And in, time, in the time that we waste, what happens, what God says to us begins to dissipate. And it's not as strong as it was when he first spoke it. And therefore, we begin to devise our own ways and do things our ways rather than what God was trying to tell us. But we don't find that in the life of Joseph. He understood what God's orders meant. He always responded in a good heart with full obedience. And so as I believe the script for Joseph was already written based on God's ability to see the past, present, and future, he saw Joseph as a perfect person to raise his only begotten son. He knew Joseph to be a man full of trust and obedience. He knew Joseph would be faithful to listen to his voice and follow the instructions along the way. And so therefore God chose Joseph. And so Joseph and Mary were really prophetically bound together in the spirit already. And so when they met each other, I believe there was an instant, ah, oh, I get it, I get it. God has already bound us together. And so how did Joseph become convinced to get engaged to Mary? How did that play out? And the Bible doesn't really say too much about that. Although there are traditional accounts. There's other gospels, can canonical, how do you say that, canonical? 
canons of the Bible that did not make it into this Bible. But there's elements of truth in them. Sometimes we have to discern what is and what isn't. But nevertheless, there's a lot to say about Joseph in the Gospel of James. And so the Bible does not provide a detailed account of how Joseph and Mary met. However, according to the Gospel of James, an early uh, canonical, <laughs> I'm not even gonna say that word, Gospel, <laughs> some accounts are preserved. The account of Jesus' half-brother James says Mary was entrusted to the temple and you can take this for whatever it's worth, but I think it's interesting just to ponder this for a moment. At an early age when she reached puberty, a proper husband was sought. Now you have to remember back in those days, it doesn't happen like it does in our day. It doesn't. So a proper husband was sought for her. The high priest would go in taking the robe with the 12 bells into the Holy of Holies. In this case, he prayed concerning Mary. Now what happens next is, I believe, a picture of how God in his sovereignty works with free will. Remember, God picks and chooses whoever he wants for his sovereign purposes based on his foreknowledge. Remember the scripture in, in both Jeremiah and Isaiah which says, can the clay say to the potter? <laughs> no. The potter's making what he wants, <laughs> what he wants. <laughs> and, and when he's done, you'll be there. <laughs> and so, you know, God is God in all things. I don't care how you put it, his sovereignty rules. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, saying unto Zacharias, and I believe this is the same Zacharias that was serving in the temple during uh, John uh, Baptist and his father. Go out and assemble the widowers. Go out and assemble the widowers of the people. This is where they kind of get the idea that Joseph, he was actually married before and his uh, former wife passed away. And it was common knowledge that Joseph had been married before and then lost his wife. And so we can see this. It's also, if you read some of the early epistles from Clement and others, they mention this as well. It goes on to say, let, him, let them bring each a rod, and to whomsoever the Lord will show a sign, his wife shall she be. And the heralds went out through the circuit of Judea, and the trumpet of the Lord sound, sounded, and, and all ran. And Joseph, throwing away his axe, went out to meet them. And when they had assembled, they went away to the high priest, taking with them their rods. And he, taking the rods of all of them, entered into the temple and prayed. And having ended the prayer, he took the rods and came out and gave them to him. But there was no sign in them. And Joseph took his rod last. And behold, a dove came out of the rod and flew upon Joseph's head. Kind of the same thing that happened when Jesus was baptized, huh? The dove came. And the priest said to Joseph, you have been chosen by lot to take into your keeping the virgin of the Lord. And this is you have to also understand. In the Old Testament, the throwing of the lots was how they determined the big things that needed to be questioned. It went on all the way up until the day of Pentecost. It was the way they chose uh, Math, was it Matthias over the other person take Judas's place. But after that, you never hear of the lots again. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit came. And we don't cast lots anymore. We have the Holy Spirit to guide and direct our lives. But up until then, that's how they determined these things. And the priest said to Joseph, you have been chosen by lot to take into your keeping the virgin of the Lord. And Joseph said to Mary, Behold, I have received you from the temple of the Lord. And now I leave you in my house, and I'm going away to build my buildings, and I shall come to you, and the Lord will protect you. And so as he's away, that's when Mary gets pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph's response to Mary being found with child. Let's read this. 
in Matthew 1 and verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found a child of the Holy Spirit. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. And to put her away secretly meant that Joseph was thinking about divorce, as the law of Moses gave the husband the power to do. He would have had to specify the cause of the divorce, which he wasn't willing to do because he didn't want to make her a public example. I believe that must have been a great trial of his faith, right? Of his faith right there. Because they would have had to go to the high priest and everything else and, and present what happened and determine whether she was going to be stoned or, or whatever. So this is a big deal. And Joseph aces it. <laughs> had she not been, had she been connected with a cruel, passionate, and violent man, she would have died in disgrace. But thankfully, God knew Joseph, amen? And God picked out Joseph through his foreknowledge. He so ordered it so that she would betrothed, be betrothed to a man mild, amenable, tender, and because of his trust in God. Because of his trust, God was able to order his steps in the right way. In Matthew 1, verse 20, now Joseph is giving a serious thought to this because he's a righteous man. He wants to follow the law. But while he thought about these things, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. I want you to remember that phrase right there. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled. God is very concerned about fulfilling his purposes. All this was done that it might be fulfilled through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so once again, this shows God's sovereignty working together with our free will for his prophetic purposes to come to pass and to show that they were bound together through God's perfect will and prophetic purposes. And so now jo Joseph has a choice to make. He could either trust in what he heard the angel saying in the dream, or he could have concluded, if he, if he began to doubt that, he could begin to conclude that it was just a dream that was brought on by his fear. Very natural thing for him to think about because he has this dream now, but he also knows the consequences of what could happen because of this dream. The fear that now he has to make it known that Mary, that he is not <laughs> the, the father of Jesus. And that Mary, as far as they were concerned, had an adulterous affair. And so it's not like he's having an angel. You know, when, when Mary was confronted about it, the angel stood right before her. With Joseph, the angel's in a dream. <laughs> it's more subjective. Where Mary, it wasn't subjective at all. There's the angel. <laughs> okay. I got it. It wasn't that easy with Joseph. And so Joseph being aroused from his sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took him his wife and did not know her 
till she had brought forth her firstborn. In other words, he didn't have intercourse with her until Jesus was born. So, so they called him Jesus. And so we know that Jesus, Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees, that it was commonly thought that he was born illegitimately. It says in John 8, 41, when Jesus is having that great confrontation with the Pharisees, where he says, before Abraham, I knew you. <laughs> and he uses the word, I am, about himself. And, and then they are ready to pick up stones and kill Jesus. And J Jesus says, you do the deeds. No, they said, you do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, no, Jesus said that, I'm sorry. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And so that's what Joseph is encountering at this point. That Mary, his wife, everybody's thinking that she was born of fornication. And so it would have been very easy for him to step back and say, I don't know anything about this. But he had to step forward and say, she did not. Amen? I know that she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And that's the truth we are going to stand by. And now, Joseph is warned in a dream. Oh, excuse me. Mary gives to Jesus due to the census decreed by Caesar, Caesar, Caesar Augustus. Joseph and the pregnant Mary traveled to Bethlehem. Joseph's ancestral home where Mary gave birth to God's only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they, they worked it all out. Amen. They worked it all out, went to Bethlehem. The place that God also prophesied would be the place of his birth in Micah 5, verse 2. I think Aaron talked about that last week. And so they made it. They're fulfilling the prophetic purposes of God concerning the birth of his chosen son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Joseph is warned in another dream to go to Egypt. After the Magi visit, Joseph is warned in a dream that he and his family must flee to Egypt to escape Herod, and Joseph obeys. Again, uh, let's read this. Then being divinely warn warned in a dream, they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country another way. That's concerning the wise men. Now, verse 13, now when they had departed, behold an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise, take your young child and his mother, flee to Egypt. I wanna want say something to you about this. Again, it's a dream with an angel appearing in it. And we see every time that God speaks to Joseph, that's the way he does it. And what I wanna to say to all of us here, God has his ways of speaking to us. He doesn't change mid-course. He, he, he helps us to get familiar with how he speaks into our spirit so that we recognize that voice speaking into us. And that's what he's doing with Joseph. He's teaching him how to recognize his spirit and what he has to say each and every step along the way. It's always a dream with an angel appearing. And so as we grow and mature in the Lord, we will have to learn these lessons if we are to be properly used by God because we are spirit beings. If we try to do ministry in the flesh, it will, not, it will do nothing but give birth to dead works. And there's already enough dead works in the body of Christ that we don't need anymore. We need people filled with the spirit of God that know how to discern the voice of God so that they can walk in truth and obey in truth, amen, and move forward in the prophetic purposes of God. I believe that there are many prophetic purposes in God that need to be fulfilled before Jesus can return. In fact, if you look at Acts 3, 19 to 21, it says Jesus is literally being held in heaven 
literally being held in heaven or tied to heaven until the fulfillment of everything has come to pass. Until all that the prophets have prophesied come to pass. He's literally being held in heaven. So therefore, get ready for this, because you may not like it. Jesus is not coming back tomorrow. There's too much to be done. There's to, they, we're not a bride without spot or wrinkle. We're not there, folks. But if we want to enhance the coming or speed up the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's up to us yes. to begin to walk in the prophetic purposes of God through trust and obedience. Being obedient to his spirit, that's where it begins. As we, as we take that step of faith and say, Lord, I believe that's you speaking to me. How am I to respond to this? And Joseph, every step of the way, knew how to respond. But that was the voice of God. And he didn't wait for a second voice. He responded immediately. He got up in that same night and fled to Egypt. And so verse 13, I'll read it again. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. <laughs> I'll bring you word again. For Herod will seek the young child and destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled. Again, prophetic passages of scripture have to be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord to the prophet saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. And so as I already mentioned, notice the rhythm of how God speaks to Joseph each time. An angel comes to him in a dream. And so after Herod's death, an angel appeared to him again and tells him it's now safe to return home. Verse 22, chapter 2, verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. There it is again. In Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. And so, fearing the wrath of Herod's son, Archelaus, Joseph does not return to Bethlehem, but settles the family in Nazareth instead. Verse 22, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee and came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled again which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And so Joseph had learned to trust the voice of God. Just as each one of us has to learn how to do, we have to learn how to trust the voice of God. And if you are a born again Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit, even if you're not, the voice of God will speak to you. Amen? but we, always, we don't always know how to detect that voice. And so it's important for us to learn the rhythm in which God speaks to us. Many times in our lives, because we don't respond immediately to what God is saying, we begin to doubt in unbelief. And we miss the turn in the road. Remember, God sees the twists and turns coming our way and tries to direct our lives accordingly. In Nazareth, Joseph would spend many days, many years teaching Jesus carpentry skills and most likely the many lessons of the Jewish faith. And so as we can see from the life of Joseph, God is in control over the life and safety of his son at each stage of his life. His sovereignty is evident as he continually guides Joseph at each stage. Because of God's ability to see into the future, he was able to pick out the perfect person who would partner with him in this stage of the young child's life. 
And because of Joseph's trust in God and his obedience and his zeal of the Lord was able to accomplish all of this. And so this is a picture of God's sovereignty working together with our free will to bring about the zeal of the Lord to fulfill his prophetic purposes. And that's, that's, that's the thing that we need to get out of this. God has prophetic purposes yet to be fulfilled. And he wants to do it in his zeal, but he needs people who are abandoned unto him to do that. And so Joseph exemplified trusting, delighting, and obeying the Lord in all things. As Psalm 37 expresses, where it says, trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he shall, com he shall give you the desires of your heart. Why would he give you the desires of your, his, your heart? Because your desires have now become his desires, amen? You have committed your way unto the Lord. And, and also following that script, there's an interesting passage in Psalm 16 where it says, if we commit our ways unto the Lord, he will direct our steps. And then, then it, you know, it, it talks about, um, you know, the whole idea of our thoughts directing ourselves. That's what it says in uh, 16 verse 3. And then in verse 16 it says, those thoughts will now, it says the mind of man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And so a lot of times your steps are being ordered and you don't even know it because your mind has gotten so used to being in conformity to the Father's will and purpose. And so you're just going along doing what you normally do because you are so abandoned and committed and sanctified and everything else to the Lord that he can use you whenever. That he can chart a better path for your life. That he can create divine appointments in your life. He can do all things. We can do all things through God who strengthens us. Amen? And throughout the episode of the young child's early life, Joseph is shown to be humble, pious, obedient man. He takes what the angel says without complaint or even replies, faithfully follows the instructions given. And so what do we learn from the life of Joseph that will enable us to fulfill all that the Lord has given to us? I know I only have two up here, but I, I did some more after I submitted the slides. That always happens. We learn, how to be, we learn how important it is to be connected to God's sovereignty in all that we do. We learn how to trust and ob in obedience to, to what he connects us to do for his prophetic purposes for our lives. And then just as God established a rhythm in the life of Joseph, he is establishing rhythms in our lives. How to hear and respond to his voice and his commands. And just as God spoke supernaturally to Joseph how to prepare for the coming of the Messiah, we will most likely have supernatural manifestations of how he speaks to us as we prepare for the second coming of his son. Just think of this for a moment. When the Gentiles came, God called the Gentiles into the church, right? Old Testament prophecies about that. You know how that happened? Cornelius had a vision. Peter had a vision. They didn't know each other. But I believe in this day, in this age, creating strategic alliances, just as, he did, just as he did with Peter and Cornelius, and brought them together and gave birth to the Gentile church. God's sovereignty working with the free will of two different men in two different locations. That's what we have forward to look to. The Bible says everything that happened in the New Testament is gonna be a double portion of what happens in our lives today before the coming of the Lord. Just imagine all of this happening throughout the body of Christ, throughout the whole world. We will see and experience the shaking and the rattling of Ezekiel's vision, the bones coming up and put, putting flesh on the bones and the whole body of Christ standing up with one voice at the same time proclaiming the coming of the Lord. That's the last revival. 
So I, I want to close with this. It's just a quick testimony of how God began to speak to me throughout, the day, throughout my life. But more importantly, as I was transitioning out of my position here at the Rock several years ago, and um, one day, I was sitting in my chair. I don't know where I was sitting, but um, I heard the Lord say to me, you need to start writing your story. You need to write your story. And so I immediately obeyed. And out of that came this book, The Adventures of Space and Hobo. That's my story. And so after I published that, I, I, I felt like he was calling me to write more. And so what I actually began to do, I pulled out all of my sermon notes from 12 years of preaching and just started pulling out the nuggets. Just pulling out the nuggets. And then I arranged them all according to subject. And out of that, oh, I don't have that book up here with me, came my book, The Journey. Now that book, The Journey, is a good book for young Christians, for people who've been sidetracked. It goes through the whole process of how to become a man of God or God and to fulfill the purposes of God in your life. And um, I've been talking a lot about the prophetic purposes of God. That's what this book is all about. When sovereignty and free will meet. And it talks about all that needs to happen before Jesus returns. Not all, but a lot of things. The things that, you know, the things God puts on my heart. There's things he puts on other people's hearts. You know, at some, time, at some point in the future, you know, all these people who God has been speaking to concerning the last days are going to become front and center and lead the church into the most glorious revival that has ever happened. And so, with that, I say God bless you. Amen.